Hello, I'm Jared Kenna and welcome to Money in Tech. Today we're here with Mike Hearn talking about Bitcoin J, Tor, and improvements to the Bitcoin protocol. Thanks for coming on the show, Mike. No problem. So Mike, in layman's terms, what is Bitcoin J and what is Tor? Uh, Bitcoin J is a library of code which is used by other developers to build Bitcoin wallets and Bitcoin applications in general. Um, and Tor is a uh, anonymization network which prevents people from learning um, your IP address effectively. It allows you to bounce traffic around the world through a series of proxies until um, there's no way to find out where the traffic originally came from. So Bitcoin J will soon be using Tor, correct? Yeah, that's the plan. It's being worked on now. Of course, these things can always slip a little. So is this only for people that want to use Bitcoin anonymously, hide their tracks? Immediately, people begin to think about drugs and terrorism. Yeah, it's not for that at all. Um, the idea behind uh, using Tor in Bitcoin J is actually twofold. One is um, one is privacy, and one is security. Actually, it's got nothing to do with uh, privacy at all. So there's there's an obvious um, angle where uh, right now the, the Bitcoin network is unencrypted; it's completely open. Um, what that means is that. Um, Governments and their intelligence agencies are almost without question uh, de-anonymizing the blockchain through using fiber taps. And they should not be doing this, of course, but they will be because that's exactly the kind of thing their infrastructure is designed for. And it fits everything we know about them. Um, sending traffic from Bitcoin J over Tor does not completely stop this. There are still um, things they can do, but it does at least raise the bar quite significantly. So that's a privacy angle. It doesn't, because it's only Bitcoin traffic that's being routed over Tor, it doesn't really make any difference to actual usage. You know, there, there's no, um, it doesn't make any difference to people who want to trade drugs or anything like that, for example. It's uh, primarily about um, backbone interception. Um, and then the second is security, which is, uh, Right today, Bitcoin is not an authenticated network either. It's not encrypted, nor is it authenticated. So you have no real way of knowing uh, if you connect to it that you're connected to the real Bitcoin network. Right? There's no, there isn't even any notion of what real is. Um, you could run a completely different Bitcoin network and claim yours is the real one. And you know, how would you? How would anyone argue with you? Um, and so this this sort of opens up various bizarre attacks around using fake Wi-Fi hotspots and things like that. Tor is not quite so decentralized as Bitcoin, and, and it does have a definition that there is only one real Tor network, and you can verify you're talking to it by using cryptography. So by sending traffic through Tor, uh, we gain assurance that the, um, your local network connection hasn't been tampered with. So typically when someone uses Tor, it's a lot slower. Is this going to slow down Bitcoin? Um, we've done some tests on that, and we don't think it'll make much difference to uh, the wallet, how the wallet appears to behave for users. There's already a few seconds of delay sometimes uh, when you start a wallet before it synchronizes with the blockchain. And um, In particular, for example, um, the Android wallet actually will synchronize every 24 hours in the background to keep itself uh, responsive. And while it's doing that, it, it can synchronize with Tor as well. So it only takes a second or two to, to start up next time you want it. So we think performance will be largely unaffected. How long have you been working on these changes, Mike? Um, well, the idea um, the idea came up around the end of last year, the start of this year, and I did some prototyping, and actually, it's now someone else who's working. So, Mike, are we going to see this implemented anytime soon? And do we have to wait for miners to essentially approve it? Um, it doesn't. It's unrelated to what miners want. It's not actually for all Bitcoin traffic. It's only for wallets which are based on this code uh, okay. on Bitcoin. So um, basically, it will launch when it's done, and good progress has been made. We still need to do tests. We need to do tests of things like, um, you know, do we need to switch it off on slow mobile connections, right? What, what, can we tolerate 3G connections? Do we need 4G and higher? Um, you know, does it cause problems um, for old phones, things like that? We need to do some tests and to decide exactly when we can use it. But once that work has been done, it should just appear one day when you update your wallet app. Okay. If you use one based on this code, of course, not all wallets are. Okay. So Mike, what kind of issues have you seen and big challenges as Bitcoin's grown in scale? Um, you mean specifically around scalability? Right. Uh, well, what we've seen is, um, you know, the network, keeping the network decentralized has been very hard. Mining is obviously very centralized, which is not really healthy. And it's been very difficult to uh, try and, you know, fight that trend 
a lot of miners, they don't seem to really care about decentralization. They're only after the, uh, the financial rewards. So that's a challenge. And um, one thing we see as a result of that is, you know, some very large mining pools that uh, don't, you know, include very many transactions in their blocks. So they're actually reducing the overall capacity of the network by doing that. And they're doing this, usually we think, to, um, to try and um, increase their earnings very slightly because the core system does, is, is sort of not scaling well enough for them. So that's, that's one of the big problems that we think we've seen so far. So Mike, other than Bitcoin J and Tor, are there any big improvements in the Bitcoin protocol that we can look forward to? Well, so a lot of the work has been into something called the payment protocol, which mm -hmm. actually is not a core part of the, the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer protocol or the blockchain, but it's a layer on top. And we need this because it's very difficult to add features to Bitcoin at the moment because we don't have anywhere to stash the data that they require. Um, so the idea behind the payment protocol is we replace Bitcoin addresses uh, with files, effectively small, very small files that contain Bitcoin addresses, but also can contain other things as well. And um, there's all kinds of interesting features that can be added on top of that. We're starting to see people do things like um, you know, uh, recurring payments for subscriptions and things, which you can't really express with just a Bitcoin address. Mike, let's talk about wallet stabilization and compatibility. Is there anything coming up? Um, yeah, most wallets right now are busy implementing what we call HD wallets, hierarchical deterministic. It's got mm -hmm. nothing to do with how sharp they are. And the idea behind an HD wallet is you, you can represent the entire contents as 12, just 12 words. You can represent all of the keys that you need to access your money with just 12 words. So this allows you to, you know, 12 words is small enough you can write them down on a piece of paper, for example, or read them out over a phone line. And the idea behind this is that um, by taking these 12 words, you can import them into different wallet apps and you will at least get your money. You might not get other things like the labels attached to those transactions or more advanced features in the future, but uh, you should always at least be able to recover your money in this way. It also allows us to resolve various problems around things like keeping different devices synchronized without needing um, complicated code that runs in the cloud and things like that. So HD wallets is a pretty big deal. So what about floating transaction fees? Yeah, that's another change that's being worked on at the moment. So um, we have adjusted the base minimum fee that you have to attach to every Bitcoin transaction in order to get a fast confirmation. Mm -hmm. um, that has gone down by tenfold actually in the release of Bitcoin Core which is about to come out. So this is the original software written by Satoshi which is what's running the peer-to-peer -peer network and um, this has some hard-coded numbers which the developers adjust occasionally uh, in, order, in order to keep up with the exchange rate and because Bitcoin has been at $500 and above for quite a long time now it was time to adjust that. But really we shouldn't have this power to be adjusting these fees and we don't really want to be doing it anyway. And so Gavin, uh, Gavin Andreessen has been working on a system where each Bitcoin node will monitor the state of the network and figure out, based on its behavior, what the minimum fee seems to be. So it's, it's monitoring the behavior of miners and calculating an estimate for the actual minimum fee. Okay. Mike, thanks for coming on the show today. No problem. For more information on Bitcoin J, Tor, or anything else we talked about today, check out the show notes on moneyandtech.com.